Look in uh, uh, Exodus 4, and while you're turning there, I'm going to lift up our missionary of the day. We're in a series, again, exploring people of the Bible. The title of today's lesson is Aaron and his call, and it's mostly in Exodus 4. Uh, our missionaries this week, you know very well, Kevin and Stacy Berg, their letters are hard to read. It's sort of like uh, Edgar Allan Poe. You can feel this darkness over the Lakota Sioux Reservation. And I'm sure people years ago meant well when they established these reservations, but they basically are isolating our friends from the light. They are completely dependent on the government. And it's just a terrible, terrible socioeconomic situation. They're at the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. That's the home to the Lakota Sioux. Listen to these numbers. It just chills you. The reservation has unemployment rate of 85%. Uh, the alcoholism, and you, you may have read their letter this week, it was a very hard letter to read. Alcoholism affects 100% of families, 70% of the men are alcoholics, half the population is 18 and under, and the suicide rate among uh, the young people in the Lakota Sioux Reservation is eight times the national average. They are spiritually in darkness also, as well as this socioeconomic tragedy. They are one of the Indian tribes that believe in a monotheistic great spirit, but they also believe in all sorts of nature lesser spirits that fly around influencing them. So it's a mixed bag, kind of like voodoo has a lot of Christianity and Roman Catholicism and then animism where you worship the ground and the plants. So if you read the letters, read uh, Stacy and, and uh, Berg's letter. Uh, she's had a battle with cancer. They don't mention it, so I hope that it's, it's doing well, but I know that was a real battle. Well, look in uh, Exodus chapter 4. Let me warm up by reading verses 14 through 18. Again today, Aaron and his co. It says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he'll be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. He shall be even shout to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And when thou shalt take this rod in thy hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. And Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law, and said, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto thy brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go and go in peace. Uh, you remember this family about Moses in the Old Testament. Moses was the mighty lawgiver of the Old Testament. He was the younger brother of Aaron. Uh, Aaron, his brother, was a wonderful orator. He was a world-class speaker. Think of Winston Churchill in World War II, and think of uh, Christostom in, that, in Christian history. Uh, and, and also their sister. You remember Miriam had a very strong personality, both for good and for bad. She uh, wrote the song of Miriam after they uh, had a great uh, victory. Uh, she also made a bad decision and, and some people that rebelled against her brother, God's man. Her, his sister Miriam was courageous and clever. She was often, however, a, a voice of common sense. What's the point? Aaron came from a gifted family and the gifts are, are divided severally as the Holy Spirit will. Your family's different. Your sister does different things from you. Your brother does different things from you. Working together, God has a plan for them all. And in your life, your, your role in life changes. Uh, I know in my life, my medical life, I was practically an ER doctor for five years, and I thought maybe that's what I'll do. And then, then you work in the hospital and ICU, and there was no, none of the specialists coming up. Boy, we were just going at it hot and heavy. And then you kind of slow down, and then... They don't do hospital anymore, you know, so somebody take over the hospital and we're just in our office and then you go down from five, five days a week to four days a week, three days a week, I'm glad. But it's just a very different phases of life. You've had that in your life, I've had it in mine. Aaron came from a gifted family, he was gifted, but God worked through his life longitudinally. He rose to the highest position a man could occupy among God's people in that day. He was the high priest of Israel and the one from whom all priests, high priests would descend in his tribe until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Aaronic priesthood was valid. It was God-given. It's gone now. 
Uh, Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron. We'll talk about that a little bit. But he was still a vitally important person in this time and this place, and God worked mightily through him. Aaron, Miriam, and uh, Moses were born in a slave hut on the backside of nowhere in Goshen in Egypt uh, along the Nile River. And when Aaron was a boy, the ruling Pharaoh, you remember this, established a plan to slowly, carefully destroy the tribe uh, of Israel uh, by taking all the little male babies that were born and the midwives were instructed to kill them. Thank God they didn't. Sometimes you obey God rather than men. When Aaron was a boy, they tried to slowly, surely, and systematically eradicate uh, the Jews. The imperial edict didn't apply to Aaron, but the sword of slavery and oppression and the mood of degradation was all around him. Moses escaped death by adoption. You remember that story into the Egyptian royal family. Moses moved to the palace at a young age. He and Aaron didn't grow up together. But let's work through Aaron's life and see if it has any lessons to teach you and teach me about different things in different phases of our life. The first thing about Aaron when he was young, and maybe nobody knew this, God recognized Aaron. He knew that he was a mighty orator, that he could persuade and sway the multitude for good or for bad. And he says in Exodus 4.14, God said to Moses, I know that Aaron can speak well. Before he formed him in the womb, he knew he was going to make him a speaker and an advocate for God's position. That's a gift of oratory. Uh, his eloquent words lifted people up to heaven himself. The golden tongue was a topic of conversation even in heaven. And this gift was used by God in a mighty way. But mark this. How many of you remember the Mary Tyler Moore show? Let me just say this. Ted Baxter, okay? Some people are very, very, Ted Baxter with here with the news. And his IQ was four, okay? Aaron wasn't Ted Baxter, but he was Ted Baxter relative to Moses. Moses was a man of God, gifted, a man of war, a writer. But he, during his life, became uh, a little bit backward to speak. And he was very concerned about that. Uh, Aaron did not excel as a scholar, a thinker, or a leader, but he knew a man who did, his younger brother, Moses. And not seeing him all the time, he heard from him from time to time. And, and off to the side, he knew that his brother Moses was one of the greatest scholars ever to matriculate at the University of Egypt. The Bible says he was learned in all the uh, wisdom of the Egyptians. He was a trained diplomat. He was a trained soldier. He was a statesman. He was a born leader. But you remember, and to his credit, Moses was exiled from the palace for standing with the people of God and rejecting the position that he had grown up in and the, in the Pharaoh's court. Uh, he was exiled, and Aaron may have been disappointed. Aaron may have been thinking, what a pity. If only Moses could have stayed in that influential position. Well, he walked with God, he followed God, he did the right thing. That's the most influential position he could get. Big, bold heart, favor at the king's court. Too bad, thought Aaron, it all washed out. But you know, Aaron's heart did beat strong and true for his people. And when he was finally able to persuade Moses with his eloquent tongue to become the looked for and longed for kinsman redeemer of the downtrodden people of God, Moses listened. God knew all about it. He knew his skill and his ability to persuade. God prepared Moses' heart even before Aaron found him. Again, Exodus 4, 16. He shall be thy spokesman, said God to Moses, unto the people. He shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. That's a strong Old Testament statement. That's like a good New Testament preacher that stands behind the word of God and speaks through it, and he's hidden, and the word of God is projected from the pulpit accurately. Same thing here. Aaron was to speak. It wouldn't be by his natural talent, but it would be by God's plan that he would be speaking the words of God given to Moses and given to Aaron and given to the people. John Philip says this, for such an hour he had equipped him. Likewise, God knows about your gifts, your talents, your abilities. He has a plan and a purpose for us. You say, I'm old. You're not as old as God. I think I'd let him decide that. For he had Aaron in days gone by. For them then and us now, there is no greater tragedy than to miss God's plan. Here was God's plan then. God would speak to Moses. Moses would speak to Aaron. Aaron would speak to Pharaoh, and Aaron would speak to the people. That was the plan. Everybody got in position, and God could unleash truth and revelation and direction 
in this mechanism. Number one, Aaron was recognized by God. God knows you. He knows what you can do and what you can't do. He knows what you think you can do and you can't. He knows what you don't think you can do, but you can. And it can be revealed if you follow this program, just like Aaron, available before God. Number two, not only was Aaron recognized by God and gifted by God and directed by God and planned by God, Aaron was redirected by God. And he is an orator. He was interested in politics, but now he was redirected to be a preacher. Little did Aaron know when he picked up his staff and sneaked out of Goshen and went to see uh, Moses to see if he could come back as any sort of prophet. Moses knew what he wanted to say, but Aaron knew how to say it. Uh, there's a lot of good people that have run for president, but I mean, Ronald Reagan was my hero. He knew how to say it. When he said it, I was just ready to go do charge ahead. This is wonderful. Aaron could communicate with clarity and with convincing power. It was odd. Now, I never thought of this. Moses, as a young man in Acts 7, 22, said that he was mighty with words. But what he was when he went out into the desert after he had to flee the court of Pharaoh, he must not have spoken Hebrew. He must not have spoken the native language, and maybe he was rusty. Maybe he was rusty in Hebrew and rusty in Egyptian. He hadn't spoken those tongues for years. Uh, what a great help Aaron's gift of oratory was to Moses as he set out to convince the people of Israel that he was going to be in God's direction, uh, the Redeemer, the crisis hour was come, and God was going to liberate his people now. You look back through Christian history. I love Christian history, and I love biography. You read a good biography of William Wilberforce, who was used by God to destroy the slave trade in England 40 years before we had it in America. Shame on us. Praise the Lord for somebody like William Wilberforce. The day that, the week that he died, they voted slavery illegal all throughout the British Empire. That would have been bigger than the day that Lincoln did the Emancipation Proclamation as far as geography and the number of people, although both were wonderful things. You read Lincoln's life. People say, oh, Lincoln was just a politician. He didn't care about getting rid of slavery. Well, you're wrong. You are absolutely wrong. You read the chapter on the preparation and the timing of the deliverance of the Emancipation Proclamation. You read about Winston Churchill. You put Neville Chamberlain up nose to nose with uh, Hitler, and we're all speaking German. I mean, that guy was a wimp. <laughs> he couldn't do anything. Winston Churchill it was just like the other ones I mentioned. You would die following that man for the right thing because of his ability to speak and, and for the right causes. Surely Aaron, even Aaron, was a little shy when he first approached the home in the house of Pharaoh. You know, <laughs> we were talking, David Linderman and I were talking, uh, the Dose Tennessee Vols, we can whip anybody down at Thompson Bowling, but Carnes Middle School can beat us three miles away. We don't do well away. <laughs> I don't know why. Same thing, a lot of people, I mean, I, I'm not a preacher, but I teach Bible. I, I'm much more comfortable here than anywhere else. It's much more easy. Uh, that's the idea. It's, uh, Aaron was maybe a little shy. And one thing to talk to your own people, your own relatives, to exhort, to rebuke, to comfort your own people. But the throne of Egypt was an awesome, awesome empire. That was a challenge. He might be nervous. He might blow it. Mm -hmm. Moses said, not a problem. I'll tell you what to say. I know what you need to say. I just don't have the ability to say it like you do. Together, this man will not be able to stand against us. He won't be able to stand against God. Here's a lesson for anyone called to minister in any capacity in, in Sunday school or whatever you do or whatever I do. Um, perhaps, <laughs> let's not say perhaps, you know and I know we're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. There are lots of knives in the drawer. And if you wait around until you think you're absolutely got everything down cold, you're not going to do anything. I, when I was saved in 1985, we moved to Louisville, uh, and I was uh, on Topside Road there, right across, you may know where it is, Beach Grove Baptist Church. I had no Christian background. I was saved. I thought, well, I was saved at a Baptist church. I went out my front porch, and there's a Baptist church across the street. It could have been the worst church in the world. I didn't know. I thought, well, that's where I got saved. That must be the right church. I went over there. It was wonderful. Bob McCullough baptized Nancy and I within a few months. He was a role model for me. He was a World War II veteran that spent 19 months in a German prisoner of war camp. And he said, you know, I thank God he's protected me. I've never had any PTSD, even though I, I, I can understand why people would. 
He said, it was something else. And he said, I'll tell you what. He said, after you go through that, when you're going to have a deacon's meeting and there's a rumor there's mad, you don't really care that much. <laughs> after, <laughs> he said, the deacons are mad. Whoa. <laughs> he said, I'm just glad to be alive <laughs> after that World War II camp. So anyway, that's the idea is uh, you say, well, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Well, you've got people on your side that do. That's the idea. Perhaps you're not the most extensively schooled in a subject. Well, I know what I was talking about, Bob McCullough. I thought, why am I telling that story? Uh, I went to him and I said, you know, I'd like to do something. The only thing I've ever done is teach, and I know that's a talent as well as a gift, so I don't know if I have a gift or not. And he, I said, I'd like to do uh, senior high a training union. That was the senior high group. And then in a Sunday school class in the morning. And, and then somebody said, that's a little bit too much. You've only been saved about a year. And he laughed. At, he had kind of a rough laugh. And he said, if you wait around until you got everything down pat, you'll never do anything. You'll learn as you go. That's the only way to do it. Just trust God to pull you along week by week. In that situation that Aaron was in, we should look, just like he looked, for a man like Moses, who is mighty in the word and the things of God, to give us truth and build us up. And this was before the internet, of course. This was, I think we were baptized in 85 or 86. And uh, so we had little pamphlets and magazines and maybe some TV shows. But there's always something there to build you up. That you could, by person, by book, by eight track, by, not eight track, what do you call it, cassette tape. You could, it wasn't that far back. <laughs> it's a vital Christian truth that we need to sit under and receive sound, sharp, salty teaching every week. Even though... I mean, not every class is a direct teaching class. It all involves transmission of truth. That's the idea. Don't rest, here's the point, Dr. Phillips says, until you find a place to receive and to give out, to be taught, and to teach somebody else. Well, Aaron became a successful preacher. The night of the Passover came. Millions were glad that they'd received the truth from Moses through Aaron that the blood of the lamb applied to the doorpost of their heart would cause the death angel to pass over them. Millions of Hebrews were alive. Their hearts were beating when everything else in the land of Egypt was dead because a truth from heaven had been given, and it was given to Moses, who knew how to express it, but it was also given through Aaron, who knew how to project it and get it throughout the nation. Millions were able to enter safely and surely into the truth of the redemption of the shed blood of the Lamb. It worked they heard, they applied it to their heart, to their marriage, to their family, to their children, and they lived when others died. That had to thrill the soul of Aaron. That makes a difference. God redirected Aaron, not so much as a preacher. After this, that was the only episode of that. Uh, people don't need an evangelist all the time. If there's a, we come to Christ already, they need a pastor. And so God guided Aaron to the priesthood, which in the Old Testament dispensation is not exactly a pastor, but it does stand between God and man and transmit truth uh, from vertically high to low. Number one, to be a preacher. Number two, now transitioning to be a priest. Aaron was the first of a long line of people all the way down through the birth of Christ and the life of Christ who were leaders and intercessors in the only true religion of the world until the birth and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This religion was true. Now, it, it, it wasn't durable. It was a bridge. It wasn't going to be the final word, but it, it was true. And dealing with the things in the Old Testament, a religious, a ritualistic system, it happened to be true, so it's worth our attention. It also is a picture. These things were shown to us in the Old Testament for an example and an exhortation. That's the idea. Aaron and his descendants as priests had a sanction from God to function as mediators between God and man. And they did it through, you expressed your faith, which you're always saved by faith, through a ritualistic system that led them into an appreciation and anticipation of a coming final lamb that would pay for everybody's sins that trusted him and was the answer to all of humanity's problems. That system had now been or has now been abolished. So don't look back into this. People, new believers might get into the Old Testament and think that was still operative. 
there is now, you know this, but one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But that ritualistic system looked forward to the final Lamb of God as we today and I in 1985 look backward to the final Lamb of God. In time, space, and history, he, Christ and his work, his person and his work were injected into human society and it was there's no other work that's efficacious. In the old, you look forward to it. In the new, you look backward to it. But Christ's life applied to us, Christ's death applied for us, is the only answer. Look in Hebrews 5, 4. It says about the priesthood, No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Uh, God did rightly and truly call Aaron into a legitimate priesthood. I grew up in Missouri for about seven years. Uh, there's a lot of Mormons up there. I've always liked Mormons, I think, because they were in, in my high schools. They were the nicest people. They were. They was always. They were always. I mean, you. If you wanted to get saved by being nice, your Mormons will lead the way. You don't get saved by being nice, so don't follow them. But in Missouri, it was called the RLDS, the Reformed or Reserved. I can't remember. But anyway, the idea is that. Uh, Let's make sure I get this right. Brigham Young was killed by a mob at Nauvoo, Illinois. He was in jail and they killed him. Those Mormons stayed, the ones that followed him, there in Nauvoo, Illinois. Brigham Young led a whole bunch of other ones that became a lot bigger out west and became just the LDS, the Latter-day Saint Church. Uh, that's the idea. The point of this story is that some of my friends in high school and they had a little thing called firesides where you'd go and sit and they were very nice. They brought out the nice food. They were very nice people, the nicest people I ever met. And uh, they would all be found at uh, a temple ceremony to be, to be connected to some of the 12 lost tribes of Israel. Well, if you were in the tribe of Aaron, you were still a very special priest in the Mormon church. And I had friends that just went on and on about which priesthood they were in. Well, this priesthood is the only legitimate one in the Old Testament, Aaron's priesthood. All the high priests had to be descended from Aaron. That's the idea. Aaron's call to priest is seen here in uh, Exodus, first by a symbolic consecration. He is set apart and he is washed carefully. And God, in this sense, doesn't insist that his ministers always be perfect or clever, but they must be clean. Aaron was a feeble, faltering person like ourselves. Don't think that Aaron, either in a false religion like Latter-day Saints or a, uh, an Old Testament view, were some kind of perfect people. They were not. As soon as Moses went over the hill, they couldn't find him. They turned on Aaron, and Aaron said, let's build that golden calf. Yes. <laughs> and then, you know what? That was a mistake, a very bad mistake. And God was furious, and uh, Moses was furious. That's the idea. There was, number one, a cleansing because he needed it. Number two, there was a putting on of apparel. Every bit of the garments in the Old Testament, the instruments of the priesthood and the temple were suggestive and showed us about things about the reality of the Christ, which they were just bit, but a pattern. Each garment spoke of Christ, the great coming high priest. There was a fine twined linen coat. Uh, which pointed to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the embroidery on that coat spoke of the beauty of the Lord's character. The blue of the robe pointed us to heaven. The, uh, the fact that Jesus was the one from heaven. He was seamless. Remember how they, they argued and uh, gambled for his coat at the foot of the cross, because, but they didn't want to tear it up because it was such a beautiful, beautiful coat. Same as these priests in the Old Testament. Bells and pomegranates on the robe, all sorts of symbolic interpretations. The ephod was a, something to hold the breastplate in place and studded with 12 stones that spoke of the 12 tribes of Israel and close to God's heart, just like we're close to God's heart now. The mitre was kind of a white linen turban. You've seen some of those Old Testament paintings. They're very elaborate. They look kind of like uh, Eastern Orthodox or something, you know, um, miters like that. And on, on this golden plate that was placed up in the miter was a, was a solid gold plate that said, Holiness under the Lord. So here's the leadership and the holiness of God's high priest in the Old Testament pointing to the leadership and the holiness of God's final high priest, capital H, capital P, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, every minister and every missionary 
and every pastor and teacher ought to represent the Lord Jesus Christ in all that they do and they say. They should be clean. They should have these attitudes that were physically shown in the Old Testament. Uh, the Jewish priest was the representative on earth of the Lord from heaven at that time. Good for him. They did what they could. There's no need to make fun of what they did. It was very important. It was God ordained. And today, what we do is God ordained. Today, John Philip says, all believers are priests clothed in the righteousness of Christ and displaying his glory and his grace. Finally, this uh, consecration of Aaron from a preacher to a priest, to the high priest, is not only his ablution, which means his cleansing, his apparel, his clothes, but his acceptance. He was cleaned, he was clothed, he was ready to minister at the brazen altar and the golden altar, standing in the high place, looking at the light of the lampstand, contemplating the bread on the table. Once a year, he entered the Holy of Holies itself and became uh, forward to the immediate presence of God before the ark, before the mercy seat. And at that point, the Shekinah glory of God filled that place and would have knocked his eyeballs out if God hadn't protected him. God accepted him and did not kill him. So we know that it was just like we know that Christ offered to take our sins on his back was accepted in that he rose and death had no power over him. Same way here. These people were not killed dead. That's the worst kind of being killed is when you're killed dead right there in the high priest. Not only Aaron redirected by God to be a priest and then consecrated, also his calling. You know what Aaron was to do? He was to meet the needs of his people, of God's people. Uh, assisting and ministering to the poor, helping to offer the five major offerings, sin, trespass, meal, peace, burnt. They were showing outwardly and symbolically the way through which faith in the God of heaven and the future sacrifice, the lamb, and the Lord Jesus Christ when he came would actually save us. That's the idea. Only then could he lead them in worship. People came to him with their burdens of sin. He pointed ahead to Calvary's cross, just like Jesus Christ in his life and the Holy Spirit now through Christ and through the word point back to that finished work now. He ministered at the golden altar, incense burning, fragrance rising, uh, ministered in the holy place, made sure the golden lampstand was trimmed up and burning bright, bread on the table every week, feasting symbolically at this point, looking ahead to Christ, the bread of heaven. So this is the sublime... Uh, calling to which God directed Aaron. His vocation was the highest vocation you could have in the, the nation of Israel at that time. He was the priest of priests. He was the highest of the high. Uh, kings wield secular earthly power, and for a short season, the high priest wielded the um, highest amount of spiritual power. But since Aaron was a fallen person and he was not the Lord Jesus Christ, we go to the next point, which was not only Aaron redirected by God into being a pastor, excuse me, into being a preacher and then into being a, a priest. Now he's restricted by God. You read the Old Testament. My mother, I remember when she was saved and you all prayed for her years ago and she was saved in December of 95. And she was just, you know, young Christians. I mean, she was 60 years old at that time, but still she's a young Christian. She said... I'm going to read the Bible straight through. She said, what should I do, the Old Testament or New? I said, they're both just great. You just go however you want. And she said, well, Dr. Rogers says we're a New Testament church. Do I have to read the New Testament? No, I said, you can read the Old if you want. She said, I'm going to read the Old first. About two weeks later, she called me and she said, this is the wildest bunch of people I've ever read about in my life. She said, if this was a bookstore, it'd be rated R. They're chasing each other around. They're stabbing each other in the back. I said, well... Warts and all. I mean, if it said anything else, you couldn't think it was real. But she was, it was just so funny because she was dead serious. She said, I've never read anything like this in my life. Uh, well, anyway, Aaron, Aaron's restricted because the priesthood was built on a foundation of human beings. That is always a faulty foundation. Doesn't mean God wasn't right to try it. Doesn't mean that God, he does his work through us now, and we're a very faulty foundation. He's, hel he's helping us as he can. The priesthood, mark this, you know it, just like my mother, failed almost as soon as it began. One generation down, Aaron's sons were worthless. You know, Billy Sunday's one of my heroes. His sons were worthless. They absolutely, it was just a shame, and it broke his heart. And Ma Sunday, that was his wife's name. She was the big uh, 
sort of the mother of the Bible uh, people back in those days, but it was just so sad that it brought him down to the grave early. They said, well, the sons of Aaron offered strange fire before the Lord. Instead of fire from heaven, they whipped up their own fake earthly fire. God judged them. The fire came down, and they were obliterated, consumed. God still didn't want any strange fire whipped up on channel five zillion on your cable set by some wacky person. We want God's truth. Uh, God doesn't work in and by the energy of the flesh. He operates through the Holy Spirit in our life, who has the ability, not that we do it perfectly, to correct us and to direct us. Much of the nonsense and the powerlessness of so-called preachers in our land is this strange fire of man's invention. And you can do it cold, too. You can run a church like a corporation. There's all sorts of books about that. I was at the airport all this last week, you know, going to visit, uh, going to my grandchildren wanted to go to Disney World. We, we had fun, and then Rebecca had her baby early, and so we're going to be flying around. But there were books even at the, at the little airport bookstore about spiritual things. They were, never, they were not real strong, by, but I was just, it touched me that I, how people would be interested in that, and even the world would sell those books because people want have questions they want answered. Well, a couple of the books about your life were based on corporate theory. This man was 27 years a corporate advisor for the highest of America. And, and I thought, well, he has nothing to tell us. That doesn't make a bit of difference in running a church. Uh, you know, like John MacArthur's series on that, just there, we have a design plan already. Well, anyway, uh, by New Testament times, the high priesthood was a high political prize. You remember low lowlifes like Annas and Caiaphas, who had wiggled their way into the uh, House or the Senate or the presidency, uh, spiritually speaking, of the nation, Aaron fell apart too. Now, and again, don't make fun of Aaron. You and I have fallen apart, and some of us do it on a weekly basis. We absolutely are not strong people, but Aaron, don't put in your mind like, oh, if I was an Old Testament priest and a high priest, I would be a mighty person. I would, would never do anything wrong. Yes, you would. Look in Exodus 32. In verse 1, you will remember this story. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, up getting the Ten Commandments, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, ha, the man which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we, what, we, not, we don't know what has become of him. That's a bunch of dirty lies. That's absolutely... Uh, I mean, in the swiftness of it, he was only up, he wasn't up there for years. Uh, he just went around the corner and they said, okay, now here's what we can do. We got a little time, we can do what we want to do. And they went just absolutely berserk. And you know what Aaron should have done? He said, don't do it. I'll not lead you that way. And Aaron said, uh, okay, looks like the polls are in favor, so we'll shift our position right here. Aaron gave in. They melted all the earrings and the golden ornaments and everything and took out their mold. Um, of a golden calf and made one of an idol. A man may be able to speak well when everyone's applauding him or patting him on the back or he's in kind of a very uh, receptive audience. But when he is wrong and won't stand up for right, then it shows he has no backbone, no courage, no conviction. Aaron could speak for Moses, but he couldn't speak for himself. So he wasn't a strong foundation to lay your salvation on. He was a picture of someone coming who is the actual high priest and the actual mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea. This man, again, I hate to say it, Ted Baxter. Don't forget that. Aaron's love for applause led him into terrible sin. Number one, his priestly failure. Number two, his parental failure. You're not in charge of your children 100%, but you have more influence than anybody else will, and you should do what you can do. So however you want to apply the blame, let me mark this. Nadab and Abihu were worthless and the Hebrew means worthless, absolutely, totally worthless. Aaron never got over to them that this wasn't the family business, that it was dead serious dealing in the things of God for good or for bad. Aaron paid a high price for this. He lived to see his sons devoured by God's flaming wrath, and God said, don't you even shed a tear. I heard uh, Dr. Rogers say that about one time. They said, how could I enjoy heaven knowing that my boy... My sweet boy, rejected Christ, is in hell. He said, you'll be so close to the heart of God and the mind of God then when this life is stripped away that you would gladly help your 
the, the, the uh, Lord Jesus Christ just dropped somebody into hell that rejected him. It would seem so awful to you. And I thought, boy, that's going to be different. Uh, Moses even forbade Aaron to show grief. These boys deserve to die. Um, it's always been a debate over uh, capital punishment, but and I'm not making light because it would be terrible to inflict that if you weren't very careful, but it's even worse not to carry out justice of men by men. Those who are called and consecrated to a pastoral ministry can be certain if they don't direct their family, God will try, and if God fails, he will step in, and it, the consequences can be terrible, especially if their behavior dishonors him. So Aaron was not perfect. Don't become an RLDS Mormon and think you're going to get in by being in the tribe of Aaron. He had priestly failure. He uh, gave, in, gave in when he shouldn't have. He had a parental failure. His kids turned out terrible. They may have turned out terrible if he tried, but the implication in this story is that he didn't do as well as he could. And personal failure. Miriam is actually a very good person. I like Miriam, his sister, but she didn't do well in this one instance, so don't look down your nose at her because you've not done well at a lot of things either. Aaron was easily swayed by the advice of his sister Miriam. Joining Miriam, he criticized Moses because Moses married an Ethiopian woman. This is just racism. He said, that's the wrong color person. That's not right. And even back then, there was nothing about that. That was wrong. You know who decided who Moses would marry? Moses and the woman he was going to marry could decide that. That's exactly what they could do. And God was not interested in, in getting into these throwing elbows and making fun of the leader and whispering behind his back and making these uh, racist comments to him. And, and it was just absolutely, obviously wrong. It was none of their business, Aaron or Miriam or anybody else, who Moses married. That was between Moses and the woman and God. Marion lashed out against Moses. Aaron joined her in a campaign of gossip and harsh words. And I want you to know that's beneath them. They were important people. And they still are, and they're still good people. But this was, they did something wrong here. Uh, I, how small-minded and weak and immature they behaved then. And you know what? I'm not just making my opinion that this was not the right answer. Judgment followed. Miriam was struck with leprosy. And always when people are struck with leprosy, they know immediately, quickly, that it's a, a judgment from God. And a lot of them didn't get better. Aaron avoided a similar fate only because God decided to honor the office that he had. But he deserved it. At, at 123 years old, and again, Miriam and Aaron are in heaven, I'm sure. We'll see them, and let's, we don't, we're not, not trying to run them down. But that, that just shows that the best of men are but men at the best, and they have clay feet just like we do. At 123 years old, Aaron died. Um, numbers 20, uh, 22 through 29 pictures Aaron being stripped of his priestly robes, laid to rest in the wilderness on the wrong side of Jordan, uh, and given a funeral. And you say, well, that bad old Aaron. Well, that's bad old humanity. We, w we probably wouldn't have done a lot better. We've got just as many issues to work through as, as they did then. We best take our eyes off the Old Testament high priest Aaron and look ahead to the New Testament high priest Jesus, who knows about our weakness and our wickedness and loves us anyway and is working uh, to redeem all things to himself. And it's, it's, it's going to be wonderful. It's, his, his power is a thousand times more than Aaron. The Holy Spirit tells us the tale that Jesus is a different type of high priest. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of not Aaron, but Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a mysterious character of half man, half uh, God in the, in the very, very unusual method of talking that was high priest. He was king of Salem, king of peace and righteousness. Uh, they tithed to him in the Old Testament before the giving of the law. This was hairs. I mean, my hairs are going up back in my heart right now. If he walked in here, we just, we would go, whoa, there is a snap in the air all of a sudden. And so that's who they're saying Jesus is. Thou art a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here's Christ who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, 
Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Aaron had his time. Like Shakespeare said, we all get our 15 minutes on the stage and we uh, are ushered off stage left and, and we just have a very short fleeting time. Uh, every, they only have one week of the paper now. Boy, we've got a good paper. This is free. There's no, I know the Gentries and those writers, Steve Brown's, uh, Mark Brown, Steve Mir, they do a wonderful job. Uh, that's, that's just absolutely good. But the point is there are more, it seems like there's more obituaries now because they're all in one one week, you know, instead of split up. And I've always, I'm not doing anything bad to anybody, but I've always known a lot of these people that have died every week, you know, and I've, I, I know all about them. And now that we only have one paper, it seems like there's more people there. But then also, I'm 62 instead of 27, and so the people I'm in there now are not my patients so much as my friends. So pray for me, I'll pray for you. <laughs> But uh, we, you can't build a priesthood or any other religion on fall, feeble, frail human beings. Our hearts are half a heartbeat from forever. You're God. I mean, you're, God's, God's fearfully and wonderfully made you. And it's, if you had a car that was built in 1940 or something, and it had been running... Since 1940, you'd be pretty impressed with that car. You'd say, yeah, well, maybe a few little uh, changes. I, no, I don't, I don't mean running and stop it and repair it and work on it. Running without ever stopping. Any repairs having to be done while it's running. A uh, surgeon went to a mechanic, and the mechanic gave him his bill, and he said, that's an awful lot. He said, well, I figure we're doing about the same. He said, yeah, go ahead and try to fix my car while it's running. Fix the motor, the pistons, everything, while it's running. He said, that's the difference. I thought that was pretty good. The Holy Spirit tells us, and in the end, Aaron, like all of God's workers, was replaced. God buries his workers, but his work goes on. This is a complicated lesson. I told my wife, I said, this is a very complicated lesson. But the takeaway point is the priesthood was given to men, and they did their best, and it wasn't perfect. But it was just a shadow and a picture and a foreshadow of the perfect high priest and righteousness to come in the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, we won't have Sunday school next week because we've got global focus, but we've still got a few more lessons of this, so be sure to come back. Father, thanks for this lesson, and thanks for Aaron and Moses and Miriam and all the fallen, imperfect people that you've worked through, and thank God you did because that means you can work through people like us. Help us learn from this and, and to, uh, try to follow you as close as we can. And thank you for the upcoming week. Amen.